Come on, man. Teach us how to kill something. Next, Better. on a special episode of Survival Science. That's what you want, it's idiot proof. There's no way to fail Perfect, with this. Laura. Yeah. Nick and Laura are deep in the wilderness. At Survival School, they'll master critical strategies every outdoorsman should know. Yes! Fire-breathing treasure! <laughs> Whether you're lost, injured, starving, or worse. I'll give you the beaver fever if you're yeah. not careful. This training can mean the difference between life. Seriously, it's like phenomenal. And death. That's amazing. Oh, Hey everybody, welcome back to Survival Science. You know, Nick and I are all about breaking down life and death situations when it comes to spending time in the backcountry, and today we're pulling out all the stops. That's right, we're going into survival mode. Uh, and we're gonna see what happens when you get lost in the wilderness and what you can do to survive. So we're up here in the mountains at the Survival Training School of California, and we're going out into the wilderness with nothing, not even your mascara. <laughs> I'll leave it at home. But we will have an instructor. And he's gonna teach us how to do things like purify water, find food, build a shelter, and maybe a little orienteering. So if we do get caught in the wilderness, we'll know exactly how to survive. You don't think we're gonna to have to eat any bugs today, do you? I hope so. Of course you would say that. Let's go. <laughs> Thomas Coyne of the Survival Training School of California trains everyone from civilian outdoorsmen to elite military units. He's going to get Nick and Laura up to speed on his unique survival techniques. Thomas, you're gonna kind of walk us through survival training, teach us what to do, how to survive. What are some of the things that we're gonna do in your course? Well, right now we're gonna get you ready for the most common survival situation, because that's what you're most likely to face in the outdoors. The most common killer in the outdoors is exposure. Each year, over 1,300 people die from exposure in the wilderness. The colder it gets, the harder it becomes for the body to maintain a consistent internal temperature. <laughs> Lessons Nick and Laura learned the hard way. Oh my gosh! So first things first, in cold weather and high altitude like this, is we're gonna need to create a microclimate. And a great way to do that is with a shelter. Building a simple shelter that protects you from the elements is the first step of survival training. Let's get building. Awesome. With that, Thomas demos the basics of building a life-saving shelter. What about hip high? Hip height, Laura. <laughs> hip height? Her height? No, her might. Like this. Thank you for having that. My right. height. <laughs> well, in. the thing is, it's built to the person making it, so it's sized for you. The basic tripod frame provides a sturdy foundation. Walls sloping 45 degrees make the structure more stable in windy conditions. A few large sticks are leaned against the tripod for additional support. Medium-sized sticks are woven in between. Pine needles are gathered from the forest floor and piled onto the frame until there is no light leaking to the inside. They keep the heat in and cold out. A final layer of sticks holds the pine needle insulation in place. In just 30 minutes, it's almost complete. The last touch is a row of rocks to reflect heat from the campfire back towards the shelter. Lift with the back, not with the legs, right? Right. <laughs> I'm bringing over baby rocks, but they'll go somewhere. We're not here to judge. Thank you. Teamwork makes the dream work, my friends. With the rocks in place, the shelter is ready. Doesn't look like much, but on closer examination, it could mean the difference between life and death in the biting cold. All right, so now that you have the system down and you see how to do it, let's see how you do without a survival instructor. We're going to give you about 30 minutes because in an emergency, time is not a luxury you're likely to have. So let's see who can make the better tripod shelter of the two. Wait, wait, wait. So you just said teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah, you're going to team up with Mother Earth here <laughs> and the nature. So it's you against me. Yeah, and there's no pink out here, so get to what? work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like this right around in here. It's got a little bit of cover up above, right? Yep, I think it looks good. So why don't you put yours kind of over there on that nice little flat spot, and I'll get kind of on this little spot here. I like your zoning rules. Yeah. <laughs> All okay. right, let the games begin. All right. The competition starts with a quintessential outdoor activity, gathering wood. Hey, leave some for the rest of us. Hey, you snooze, you lose. Is this stick not going to work? I don't know. You took the lessons. It has to go lessons. this way. 
Okay, that's feeling pretty good. Nick, your fort fell. <laughs> Nick, your fort fell down. <laughs> I broke my stick. <laughs> first things first. What happened? I'm getting warm. You're gonna collect all my pine needles for me, right, Nick? I'm gonna help you, yeah. Pine needles aren't just for insulation. They also make for a dry and comfortable mattress. We're gonna build some leaf number beds. What number do you like your yeah. bed set at? 23 and a half. All right. With a little assist from Nick, both shelters are complete with time to spare. Now they're ready for inspection. Look at this, the king needs a little ornament right over his door, right? Well, You'd be surprised at how many people choose to decorate their shelter. <laughs> yes. Anyway. Well, this is great, guys. It looks like you really stick to the principles I gave you, and that's what counts. They're steeper than 45. They're blocking all the light from the inside, so I know they're gonna stop water. We have some really good reflector walls built up, appropriately spaced, and we stop the wind from blowing our cover off. So this is more than survivable throughout a night of cold. I've got one last question. As far as decorating, who won the decorating contest here? I'm a pine cone guy. Thank you. It's a little ornamental. You can have go it. with a goat, you know. Yeah, what I, mean? I put a doorbell on mine too, just in case we get visitors. <laughs> Laura and Nick have aced their first test of survival school. Next up, the quest for fire. Nick and Laura are at Thomas Coyne's Survival Training School, deep in the mountains near Big Bear, California. Their next challenge can be difficult for even the most experienced outdoorsmen. Making fire without a lighter or matches. What we're gonna do now is get a nice straight branch like this, and we're gonna spin it just as fast as we can through a much softer piece. And the friction that occurs there is gonna ignite the dust that it makes as it drills through. And we'll use that to get our fire started. Nick and Laura will be constructing a bow drill. The design is simple. Tie a string to opposite ends of the bow. Wind the drill stick in the middle of the string. When the drill stick is fixed in place over a piece of wood, the bow can be drawn back and forth. The friction creates heated dust that ignites into an ember. So we said about a little more than a hand length. That's right. So I'm gonna carve a little V in this thing. Shape one end of the stick into a point. This is secured in a rivet hole of Nick's knife to keep the stick from wobbling as it spins. The other end is flattened and will spin against another piece of wood, the drill plate. Carve a notch in the drill plate to collect the heated dust. Why is that important again, to have that V? Once that notch is full, all the heat on the tip of that drill is gonna be trapped in that notch, and that's gonna light that dust. Now, Nick channels his inner caveman. There you go, very good. A little bit more speed. Now add a little bit more pressure, just a little, pressure's last, Some perfect. Smoke. Maintain good job, full, Nick. full stroke, full stroke. Breathe. The friction drill creates temperatures of over 300 degrees at the tip. Plenty of heat to turn wood dust into an ember. A little faster. I'm gonna give you a countdown. 10, all you got, man, nine. Got eight, this, you got it, Nick. Seven, six, stop, 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 stop. Blow on that gently, blow on that gently. You already got it, you got it. Nick delicately transfers the heated dust to a bed of wispy kindling. Dried pine needles help stoke the embers into a larger flame. Yes, Watch flame. your, watch your clothes. Look yes. at that, Nick, yeah! Yes, use your convection. Don't let it go apart yet. Don't let it fall apart. We're not out of the danger zone yet. Finally, Nick carefully transfers the kindling to the campfire itself. Yes. Yes. Let's yes! Go! Fire Let's breathing go! dragon! Who's got the hot dogs? Yeah, bring out the marshmallows. That was almost too easy. No. <laughs> I can't believe it. That's a wow. delicate process. That's incredible. Nick Munt has created fire. All right, Thomas, well, we've got a good fire, so now what? All right, well, the next most critical skill after shelter and fire in this cold weather will be getting some water. All right, All right let's I'm do it. I'm thirsty. As any experienced outdoorsman knows, water can be plentiful, but if it hasn't been purified, it can be poisonous. 
The best way to purify water is to heat it. Then you're sure you've killed everything. We're gonna show you how to boil water in anything that holds water. Maybe you have a Ziploc bag, empty sandwich bag in your pocket, you got a hole in the ground, whatever. The first step is to heat up several small rocks in a campfire. Next, Thomas splits the end of a tree branch to fashion a simple pair of tongs. He uses these to retrieve the heated rocks from the flames. So just like with the bow and drill, we have to be very careful. Ooh, you can also get a facial. Look at that. Now I'm gonna grab another rock so we can increase that temperature. Three rocks is enough to bring the water to a boil. How long did the rocks sit in the fire before you moved them into the water? About half an hour right in the convective current. And so obviously the uh, bag is tough enough to withstand boiling water. What's strange is these rocks are, you know, they're getting to very high temperatures, but as long as you put them in the water first, it won't melt the bag. Now, if this rock touches the bag anywhere outside the water, it will instantly melt through the bag. Next, treacherous waters. You're gonna be shooting it out of both ends and it won't be good. <laughs> All right, so Nick and I are back at home base at survival school, and mm -hmm. now we're going to purify some water, some creek right. water, as yep. a matter of fact, yep. with nothing but some hot rocks, a couple of sticks, and a freezer bag. Here's what we do. We've heated these rocks on here for a long time, so they're good and hot. At sea level, the water needs to boil for a minute. But as you go up every 1,000 meters, you have to go another minute. So since we're up here around 7,000 feet, mm -hmm. we're gonna go about three minutes, which should be about good, right? Enough to kill all that bacteria. Yes. Delicious. Nick wields the makeshift tongs like a pro. I eat a lot of sushi, so I should be pretty good at this. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, yeah. You got it. All right. Okay. Watch this, that is very now hot. I'm gonna bring this out of the way. Here. Careful. Listen to that sizzle. Perfect. Let's get another. A few more rocks bring the water to a rolling boil. So the most important thing is to get your water and make sure that you boil it for a proper enough. amount of time because those little protozoas are pretty tough little critters and they can live right through that. They'll give you the beaver fever if yeah. you're not careful. Yeah, and if you get that, you're gonna be shooting it out of both ends and it won't <laughs> be good. The water may not look appetizing, but it's clean and ready to drink or use for cooking. In fact, Thomas has an old trail recipe that'll make good use of this batch. So what we've got here is our water that we boiled in the baggie here, and we're just adding uh, flour to it. So now we're just gonna mix this up and make a nice little patty out of it, right? And slow mm -hmm. cook it right on the coals. Yeah, we're gonna slow cook it. You know what these are called, Nick, don't you? What? Ash cakes. <laughs> no, I said ash cakes. Oh, okay. The white ash on the campfire coals prevents burning and cooks the cakes evenly. In just a few minutes, they're ready to eat. Prepare to be amazed. Prepare to be amazed. That's good. That's amazinger than heck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't have to fake it, do you? That no. Legit, <laughs> tasty, isn't it? Wow. It's cheating a bit, but ash cakes are great with honey. Seriously, it's like phenomenal. But well, what if you need something a little meatier? Oh my God, we're like lost Starving. in the wilderness. We need food. Come to our rescue. Come on, man. Teach us how to kill something. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the most simple, effective small game trap, which is the easiest to get out here in an emergency. And all you need is a couple sticks and a piece of string. You use your boot lace, a strip of bark off the willow tree, a strong blade of grass, what have you, okay? okay. Thomas starts with a heavy rock then trims two sticks and joins them together in a sort of lever. A string is attached and tied to a small stick that acts as the trap's release lever. Thomas shows the precarious process of setting the trap. Go ahead, release. I have to feel the balance point, so it right, has to be holding right. it. So now you'll see it's like a lever, see that? Sure. So now I wrap this stick around, see how it teed off when I went under my string? I've seen a lot of manuals that'll show this over the string and they can catch. Now here, I would recommend if you're doing this at home to have a safety rock, because if this falls on my fingers, that sucks. Thomas carefully places a small stick to brace the latch and act as the spring for the trap. A piece of plastic is the bait. Now, which one of you guys said that stick won't hold? Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's because it's awesome. a one, double fifth bump. The trap is ready. Laura will do the honors 
and spare the life of some hapless Southern California squirrel. Here come two squirrels that are going after the bait at the same time. <laughs> one for Nick, one for me. Ready? That's okay. amazing! Oh, I'm stuck! Oh! Oh! oh. <gasps> Awesome, man. Yeah. Very That's cool. cool. All right. Dinner is served. Coming up, medical miracles. Get it. A survival emergency in the wilderness often begins with an injury. Ah! broken bone is incredibly painful, and if you're stuck in the woods, there's no choice but to grit your teeth and bear it, right? Not so fast. For those in the know, the backcountry even has your pain relief needs covered. So here we have the willow tree. Now what's great about the willow, it just has so many wonderful uses, it's easily identifiable. Now I want you to take a small strip of that, a serving of this bark would be the size of your pinky, and I want you to chew it. This is for body weight, right? So if it's your pinky, it'll be for your body, right? How is it? It's a little bitter. Bitter. You know what you're tasting <laughs> is salicylic oh, acid. That is really bitter. Are you kidding? Oh yeah. My God. You're tasting salicylic acid, which is the chemical compound we make aspirin from. Thomas just poisoned us. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I don't give you the antidote, you're dead. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's, that's very bitter. Yeah, it's just like chewing on an aspirin. A broken limb can make a hike back to safety all but impossible. Emergency care can be the key to survival. So one thing you may not be aware of is a little device called the SAM splint, which is just a little portable flexible splint. A SAM splint and a bandage are essential survival kit items. Add a fleece jacket and you have an effective improvised splint. Nice and, and comfy. There you go. How's it feeling? Really comfortable. You're gonna be okay? I, I think I'm gonna be all right. Okay, good. Now, Nick learns to split his own leg. So let's say I broke my tib fib down here below my knee, right? So I'm gonna wrap this thing up, but I'm gonna keep kind of clumping in here so that fills the void by the knee. Right. Yeah. It's important to pad splints not just for patient comfort, which is important, right? But to make sure that the pressure from the splint is evenly applied along the leg for uh, good support. He uses the fleece as padding and a self-adhesive bandage to wrap it all together. This makeshift splint is enough to get Nick up on his feet. And if he's on his feet, he can start making his way to safety. We've got our arm splint, we've got our leg splint, but now how are we gonna get out of here? We'll go over some improvised navigation. All right. Navigation is good. Losing your sense of direction in the backcountry can be a fatal mistake. Thomas has perfected techniques to find the cardinal directions even without a compass. Okay, so now we're gonna cover a really quick and simple way to get unlost. Well, there's plenty of ways to do it with the stars, but during the daytime, we're gonna use a stick and shadow method. It's a simple idea. Find east and west by tracing the movement of a shadow as the sun moves across the sky. All you need is a stick and a couple of rocks. We're going to mark the tip of the shadow of that stick. OK, and now we'll just have to wait a few minutes. And when the shadow moves, you'll put another mark. And you draw a line between those two marks, and you'll have your east and west. As the sun traverses the sky, the shadow moves along the east-west axis. Once you know east-west, you know north-south. So this is a really good way to find the direction. You get out into the wilderness, you need to know that south is the town, north is the road, exactly. east is the river. Just pick an escape azimuth, and yeah. the, the, as soon as you step on that trail, right. you know that escape azimuth, and you only yep. have to remember one direction. And you don't have to know which way it is, just know, just know, okay, it's west, know it's east. And now if you lose your sense of direction, you can find it again with this. And if you can't find a stick in the woods, I can't help you. That's right. Now, one last tip. The essential items for your survival kit. A water purifier, first aid supplies, a multi-tool, an emergency light, 
and stormproof matches. There's no way to put this out once it gets going, okay? And that's what you want, it's idiot proof, right? Yeah. There's no way to fail Perfect, with this. Laura. Yeah. Now Easy we combine dude. that. <laughs> Keep these in your pack and you'll be ready for anything. How do you think uh, Nick and I did today in school? What, what grade would you give us? I gotta give you an A. And you know why? You guys dominated the bow drill and the shelters. Sweet. Well, I think it's safe to say we learned a lot here at Survival School. We learned how to make a fire with no tools. Yes! Oh. Build a really cool shelter. The king needs a little ornament right over his door, right? We also had a chance to purify water and taste some delicious ash cakes. <laughs> no, I said ash cakes. Oh, okay. So when you go out into the wilderness, make sure you pack your survival kit, because you just never know when you're going to get stranded. Always be prepared, right. number one thing. Well, that wraps it up for this episode, so join us next time as we put nature to the test. On Survival Science. Nighty-night, Nick. Good night, Laura. Hope you don't <laughs> snore. If I do, just put some pine cones in your ears. You'll okay. be fine. <laughs>